The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God who creates, the Son who redeems, and the Spirit who sanctifies. Amen. Please be seated. Like the land of our forefathers in Israel, our little corner of the world, which is similar in typography, it's easy to be lured into the impression that we live in a peaceful land. We always have blue skies and sunshine, right guys? While the rest of the country can have hurricanes and blizzards, What I found describing to my relatives back east when I first moved here almost three decades ago was that we do have four seasons mixed in with our picture postcard weather. We have fire season, earthquake season, rock slide season, and flood season. And because of these storms, we actually have much in common with those suddenly frightened disciples that we find in this morning's gospel. The original Greek word for the storm described in all three of the synoptic gospels, we had Mark's version today, but the Greek word is seismos, which literally means shaking. We know what seismos means, seismic activity. And the seismos word is specifically used to describe a violent storm that literally shook the water in the lake and created waves that covered the boat that then began, started floundering in the water. We know what seismic activity is like, and it's the suddenness of our earthquakes, the world shaking around you that is most frightening and can throw us into a chaotic state, much like the disciples were in the boat with Jesus on the Sea of Galilee. And this is where the newly minted disciples in the Gospel of Mark find themselves. And we can join them in that boat. We can be going along, and suddenly a storm seemingly rises up out of nowhere. A storm we might hear and see in an alarming medical diagnosis. Or a storm that arises when a loved one has been critically injured or died. A storm of maybe financial worries, political, societal. A storm of... You fill in the blank. Our lives can be filled with all kinds of personal and collective storms. But it is how we respond to the storms of our lives that our lessons from Scripture help us with today. Do we respond with fear or faith? That's the question Jesus asked. Do we live by our faith in all circumstances, allowing our fears to be fought off by our faith? Do we allow ourselves to know and be in relationship with the one who calms the wind and the sea and us all at the same time? Our lessons from Job, 2 Corinthians, and Mark all help us with the very real human reactions and feelings we have when we face, unfortunately, the inevitable storms that arise in our life. Job was living a life filled with seismic storms. He lost his spouse, his children, his property, and most of his so-called friends. 
Throughout Job's book that we equate with suffering, what we really have is a book of faithfulness. Job calls on many occasions for God to appear. And finally, he does appear in a chaotic storm. As it says in our reading today, a whirlwind. While many of you know the book of Job is the one that we turn to to kind of treat as a journeyman along the way as we suffer in this world, it really is a book about how God is found in the storm when the whirlwind is at its strongest, that God is closest to us. God is there in the worst of it for all of us. And like this portion of Job, as infuriating as it may be, God does not offer easy answers or solutions. It's not cheap grace or cheap faith. God does not offer what we might consider even straight answers. But God comes back at us with questions that challenge and grow our faith into a stronger relationship with the one who knows us and is with us from before this life, through this stormy life, and into eternal life. From Job chapter 38, there was a small typo in the bulletin. If you go to look to Job 3, you're not going to find the questions. But from 38 to 41, God asks 83 questions of Job. And the significant thing about these questions is that Job couldn't answer one of them. So it's interesting to note an answer that we do find in Job. Remember that lovely story in Genesis that begins our scriptures? And God created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't say how God created them. And yet it answers it here in Job. Do we just assume that God created it peacefully in a 24-hour period? Is that 24-hour period really millions of years? But here in Job, God vividly describes that this world, our world, was created out of chaos. The waves crashed, the winds blew, the earth had seismic activity that rivals what we're witnessing with the volcano in Hawaii. And all of creation was made by God and controlled by God in the chaos. Our side of the gentle Pacific Ocean just down El Toro Road is also controlled by God. The sound of the waves crashing and receding remind us that God controls all the rhythms of creation. And it is as it is written that the sound of a gentle seashore reminds each of us of our time spent in our mother's womb, hearing the wish of the water. Yet God reminds Job and us that we could all be wiped out in a flood in an instant if that gravitational pull from the moon disappeared or was taken away. God creates, and God creates us as part of creation. And he does not instill fear, but a healthy respect and understanding that God created all that is from before the time of our creation and through eternity. And it is in that chaos, in those waves, in those storms, that he is there for us. We join him in the boat. It's natural to feel fear and be afraid, as those disciples did. And it's imperative that we strengthen our faith so that just as it's natural when we're in the midst of those storms to know that our faith is greater than any storm that this world can throw at us. Our answers are found in the whirlwind. It is out of our fears that we can realize the depth of our faith. Job shows us how to build up a stronger relationship with God so that we can face any fear with faith. In the beginning of the book, the prologue, God says to Job to call him Yahweh, the same name that he told Moses in another whirlwind, to remind us that in all circumstances, we are in relationship with the one who created and ultimately controls everything. 
as Job loses his material goods and his life as he knows it, as we found in this morning's reading, the name Yahweh is not used. God appears to be distant. But it is when the chaos comes, the whirlwind of chapters 38 and beyond, that Yahweh returns that relational, relation, that relational name. And the God who created us and remains with us shows us that it is in our fears that God is with us and out of our fears that we realize we are his forever. A faith that is stronger than the fears can rise up seismically, just like those waves, just like our earth. And we can be shaken to the core. How do we get this seismic faith? St. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians that it is by God's grace that we are freely given, not just faith, but a deep, courageous faith. If we accept now is the time and today is the day of salvation, to know that God is listening and helping each and every one of us through the chaos. He writes, As servants of God, we will endure afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. That's pretty stormy weather, wouldn't you say? And yet, we are to respond with God's ways taught by Christ. We respond with purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and relying on the Holy Spirit power of God within each and every one of us. Though his disciples are treated as imposters, Christ acting through our actions is well known. And we die daily to sin, yet we are very much alive in the chaos. We may be punished, but never killed. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. We can be poor, yet we are rich. And we may have nothing, but through our relationship with the Creator, we possess everything. All it takes is opening wide our hearts in faith, instead of cowering with fear. We are to open our hearts and minds and spirits and souls and live by what we believe. Easy to say, harder to do. The newly minted apostles in that small fishing boat on the Sea of Galilee encourage us to see that God loved each and every one of us so much that he sent his Son to show us how creation, and as we are part of God's creation, are to be still and know that God is God. Like God who peppered Job with questions, we must not look to God for easy answers, but find our answers through reliance on a God as we live through the chaos by faith. Now, when Reverend Pat asked me to come, she didn't tell me I had to send in a bio. I don't like pictures of myself. You will not find me on Facebook. And there she goes and puts it in the bulletin. When she gave me the assignment, can you write about, you know, kind of what you've done and whatever? And I was like, and how many pages is this bio supposed to be? Because she said, well, you just say where you served and that kind of thing. And I go, okay. Well, my journey is one, a bit of bit chaotic from when I first came out here in 1991, and I've been blessed to serve congregations and people throughout the diocese amidst some storms, and I'm not telling you this because I want you in any way to feel sorry. I want to hear your story and know your storms, because those are the events that shape our faith and our ministries. I had a broken spine in 1996. I was retired from active ministry at age 33. All of a sudden, when I go visit someone in the hospital who's in pain, I can relate in a whole new way. I was then felled by a uh, tumor on the brain back in 2003, and I was told that I would probably need to go into hospice because there was no treatment. 
Well, this is 2018. So what's that make me, 15-year graduate of hospice? And I had one dying friend tell me that she could really talk and pray with me because I had faced the wall she was facing at her grave. I cared for a daughter with epilepsy who attended St. George's Academy here, and I pray that my journey with her, as she called her epileptic seizures, little earthquakes, how's that for chaos? I hope I can be with parents and children as they go through debilitating illnesses. But through the worst of the storms, the irony is looking back, what I call faith in the rearview mirror, and seeing that I felt God and Jesus' presence healing and strengthening me along some very chaotic ways, in ways that surprise and delight us. So my bio says, rather embarrassingly, I must say, that I'm finishing up my PhD at Oxford. Now, I'm very grateful for that. But it's the backstory of that that's so funny. If God had not disabled me from active parish ministry, I wouldn't have been bored at home, tired of physical therapy, and wanting mental therapy. And I stumbled into a program where I take my disabled time for ministry and somehow study and write and pray and hope to help others as I journey down a completely different path of service. When I go over to England, you see everywhere mugs, coasters, signs, keep calm and carry on. I'm changing that. Keep calm and carry faith. Because God is in the chaos, and by the faith that we are drawn into that deeper knowledge of God in relationship with Christ, those storms that rage around us are opportunities to find the peace and the stillness of God. And as Christ calmed those waves, we can find peace within ourselves and within our own storms. We can become the calm winds and the gentle seas for others. And so now I'm going to indulge you. And I don't usually preach this long for those who've heard me before. But I need to share a story with you. And if you've heard it before, please listen to it as I do. Because every time I read or listen to this story, I hear a different place in the story where we find ourselves. Because once upon a mountaintop, Three little trees stood and dreamed of what they wanted to become when they grew up. The first little tree looked up to the stars and said, I want to hold treasure. I want to be covered with gold and filled with precious stones. I'll be the most beautiful treasure chest in the world. The second little tree looked out at the small stream trickling by on its way to the ocean. I want to be traveling mighty waters and carrying powerful kings. I'll be the strongest ship in the world. The third little tree looked down into the valley below and said, I don't want to leave the mountaintop at all. I want to grow so tall that when people stop to look at me, they'll raise their eyes to heaven and think of God. I will be the tallest tree in the world. Years passed, the rains came, the sun shone, and the little trees grew tall. One day, three woodcutters climbed the mountain. The first woodcutter looked at the first tree and said, This tree is beautiful. It's perfect for me. So the first tree rejoiced when the woodcutter brought her to a carpenter shop. But while the carpenter fashioned the tree into a box, like a treasure chest, it was not covered with gold nor filled with treasure, but she became a feed box coated with sawdust and filled with hay for hungry farm animals. The second woodcutter looked at the second tree and said, This tree is strong. It is perfect for me. And with a swoop of his shining axe, the second tree fell. But she smiled when the woodcutter took her to the shipyard. But that day, no mighty sailing ships were being made. Instead, the once strong tree was hammered and sawed into a simple fishing boat. She was too small and too weak to sail on any ocean. 
or even a river. Instead, she was taken to a little lake. The third tree felt her heart sink when the last woodcutter looked her way. She stood straight and tall and pointed bravely to heaven. But the woodcutter never even looked up. Any kind of tree will do for me, he muttered. And with a swoop of his shining axe, the third tree fell. The third tree was confused when the woodcutter cut her into strong beams and left her lying in a pile in a lumberyard. What happened? the once tall tree wondered. All I ever wanted was to stay on the mountaintop and point to God. Many, many days and nights passed. Then one night, golden starlight poured over the first tree as a young woman placed her newborn baby into the feed box. I wish I could make a cradle for him, her carpenter husband whispered. The mother squeezed his hand and smiled as the starlight shone on the smooth and sturdy wood. This manger is beautiful, she said. And suddenly, the first tree knew she was holding the greatest treasure in the world. Another evening, about 30 years later, a tired traveler and his friends crowded into an old fishing boat. The traveler fell asleep as the second tree quietly sailed out into the lake. Soon, a thundering and thrashing chaotic storm arose. The little tree shuddered as she knew she did not have the strength to carry so many passengers safely through the wind and the rain. The tired man awakened, stood up, stretched out his hand, and said, Peace. The storm stopped as quickly as it had begun, and suddenly the second tree knew she was carrying the king of heaven and earth. One Friday morning, three years later. The third tree was startled when her beams were yanked from the forgotten woodpile. She flinched as she carried through an angry, jeering crowd. She shuddered when soldiers nailed a man's hands to her, and she felt ugly and harsh and cruel. But on Sunday morning, when the sun rose and the earth trembled seismically, the earthquake came and joy filled that little hill and that little tree because the third tree knew that God's love had changed everything. It had made the third tree strong. And every time people thought of that cross, that tree, they would think of God. Let us pray. We are called into relationship with you, God made man, who climbed into a small cradle and changed the world forever. We are called into relationship with you, Christ made man, who climbed into a small boat and calmed the tempest on the sea to show us that our faithful relationship with God is always greater than any storm. And we are called into relationship with a Holy Spirit filled Christ who died on a cross two centuries ago so that we, today, can live with the knowledge, by faith, to stand amidst the storms and the chaos and know God's peace. In Jesus' name we pray.